trademark designation is founded on a simple and enduring idea. People need historic places. Landmark buildings and landmark spaces offer us perspective, a sense of identity, and memories. They shape our experience, and most of all, provide us with an awareness that some things last longer than mortal existence. A lot of the, the projects that I've gotten involved in are projects that I've worked on with other people, uh, and there are, 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 are projects that are really dear to my heart. And I think particularly the thing that, that I really felt a need to get involved with was this issue of preserving the early 20th century row houses that had facades that were redesigned uh, in, in those years. Uh, there was a belief that these were altered 19th century row houses. And I came to an understanding that this was a whole new idea in urban architecture and that, that the preservation community really wasn't knowledgeable about this and the Landmarks Commission was giving permits uh, to restore them back to their 19th century character. So we were losing a lot of really important early 20th century design and it was being replaced by a sort of faux 19th century design. And so uh, I got involved in writing a book on this. I needed to do the research to convince myself and to convince other people that this was a really valuable resource. Uh, and I've been campaigning for it ever since. Action is never just one person in preservation. Action is always a group thing. So how many times I've been standing in the street demonstrating, I would like to say. I've done it in Harlem, done it in Midtown, I've done it downtown. Uh, the thing that makes you decide to take action is if you think you could influence something, and often you can't, but you have to try. I was on my way to give a, an address about preservation shortly after becoming chair of the City Council's subcommittee on landmarks, public siting, and maritime uses. And I wasn't really quite sure what to say. I started thinking about young people who were had spent the summer repairing the wrought iron fence outside of St. Anne's Church on Montague Street, and whether there were job opportunities for them, an opportunity for them to contribute something to the city, uh, and also to, uh, to, to learn a, a livelihood. So I called for the creation of a high school of preservation arts uh, at that address, um, and uh, basically uh, was ready to stand by, but didn't know quite what to do. Kate Adovino, who comes from a uh, New York family in the stone cutting business and herself is a, a quite talented, um, heard about the idea, came to me. Um, we were able to secure some initial funding and eventually uh, that school became a reality. Interestingly, I mean, early in my career, um, when I was up at the Municipal Arts Society in the early 1980s, we had just finished successfully working with all sorts of people to get the Upper East Side Historic District passed. And as is the case in preservation, you've hardly finished celebrating one victory when there's a problem that comes up. There was a tower being proposed. And immediately, as a, as a staffer at MAS, my thought was, we have to take action and create a group that is going to be the watchdog for the Upper East Side. And so I turned to Margo Wellington and I said, you know, we've been working with the community on the Upper East Side. We need to put in place an organization that's going to be the curator, the watchdog for the Upper East Side. So she basically said, yeah, it's a great idea. And I wrote a grant proposal, sent it to a couple of places. We got the seed money and we started working with the wonderful Upper East Side folks, Helena and the whole crew, and started friends. But it was one of those things where this idea just struck me that there was a need uh, I'd have to say I probably wasn't the only one who realized there was going to be a need, but I was in a spot where I could turn to someone and they said, yeah, go for it. And we found a little money and made it happen. Um, this is going to sound funny, but my inspiration has always been the people that I write about. Uh, starting back in the 1960s and 70s when I was a reporter at the old New York Post. Um, I was inspired by the people who were fighting for their neighborhood. It wasn't always for land, uh, you know, preservation. Sometimes it was a traffic light in front of a school or, or a school or, or a, a historic building. But, um, you know, at, at a time when there's so many things in the world that are depressing on the largest sense, uh, I am 
constantly inspired uh, by all the people I write about. The real estate community should be celebrating the Landmarks community for what we have done for the values of New York City. They are making gazillions of dollars on the buildings we would not let them tear down. And the highest value neighborhoods in this city are the historic districts that we fought to have designated. Without landmarks, their values would be nowhere near, the, uh, nowhere near what they are today. Uh, well, the, what I needed to take action was when the whole world was crumbling in the fall of 18, uh, 1958. We had uh, Honest John Cashmore, our borough president, teaming up with uh, Bob Moses uh, to pa basically remake downtown Brooklyn. And in the process, uh, parts of uh, uh, Brooklyn Heights were to be remade at the same time. And we suddenly realized that between uh, the new Civic Center, uh, the new Cabin Plaza under Bob Moses, the Jehovah's Witness tearing down uh, several blocks, uh, that unless we did something and quick, uh, Brooklyn Heights was going to be dust. What did you do? I invented the Landmarks Law, basically. So the uh, essence of it was we knew about Beacon Hill, and we wanted to replicate Beacon Hill. Beacon Hill had been, uh, become a uh, Stark district in uh, 1956, two years before our effort began. And uh, our thought was not to have a citywide um, historic zoning ordinance, but to have a Brooklyn Heights historic district ordinance. Uh, in 1989-90, the state was in recession. And of course, you know, that means that the funds going into all the different agencies was, were shrinking. And of course, the Arts Council was no different. And in the, for the funding year 1989-90, we were cut 42%. And, but the architecture program stayed in business. So every program was cut across the board. It would have been very simple, very simple, to just say, OK, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to do architecture planning or design. We're not going to give you know, this kind of support. It's just not going to do it. It's peripheral to what we do. Because that's what was happening across the country. The same thing, it was a national recession. The same thing was happening at arts councils across the country. And I'd spent the past five or six years, with Mrs. Hart's blessing, traveling around the country, talking to all the other state arts councils, and about how and why funding design and preservation was a good thing for an arts council, why it made sense, how it supported the other programs within those arts agencies. And the recession happened, and all those new programs went out of business. Boom, done. Mrs. Hart never, the council never considered doing that. It was just part of what we did. So we stayed in business. And I have a particularly good quote, because I asked her years later, why, why didn't you close? You know, why wasn't I laid off? And, and why didn't you stop funding this and shift the money into the dance program or whomever, which is really, she's more interested in the performing arts. And so I asked her that question, and she said, of course. It was always such an important part of our mission, a feather in our cap. It's architecture, for God's sake. It's a great quote. It never occurred to her that this wasn't something we should be doing. And nobody ever said otherwise. I certainly wasn't going to. That's fantastic. She was great. She was a rock star. I loved her. <laughs>